All right, hey everybody, welcome to our next lecture. Today we're talking about LLCs. So I'm going to kind of jump right into it here. Um, as I'm kind of pulling some screens up, I want you to know uh, LLCs are, I mean, we still kind of talk about them as if they're new. Uh, it's It's been, what, 40 years or something since we've had LLCs, but I guess in the big scheme of things, that scene is relatively new. The first one was in Wyoming, uh, just next door to us here. And the reason they did this, it's, it, I mean, the story is really interesting um, because as you now know, after our lecture on partnerships, partnerships have some great liability protections, um, but only if you're like one of those professional companies that, that, that qualifies to be in a limited liability partnership, an LLP. Uh, if you're not, then you're kind of stuck with the LP, the limited partnership, and then somebody has to be a general partner. It's there's problems there. Now, court, you could always just and and before the '70s, like you just switch to a corporation. Well, as we'll talk about in in the following lectures, when we, when we talk about corporations, corporations true do give limited liability protections to the owners, but it comes with a catch, and that's the tax. Um, and, and, and so people wanted to take advantage of partnership tax, but the liability protection of corporations, and that's really how we got the LLC. It kind of merged the best of both worlds and created a new business entity um, out of that called the Limited Liability Company. That's what LLC stands for. Now, you will hear some people say, or call it a, like the, when they talk about LLCs, they'll talk about a limited liability corporation. Um, I will slap you virtually through the computer if you ever say limited liability corporation. Don't do that. That's embarrassing. All right. So hopefully now you remember it's a limited liability company. All right. So uh, with that in mind, let me kind of switch this up so you can see my screen here. There we go. All right, so we start here with the nature of LLCs. Again, we don't call the owners of an LLC a partner. We don't call them a shareholder. Um, that's what, uh, those are different things. So if, if you have a partnership, then yeah, like, a, like an LLP, for example, if, if you become a partner at a big law firm or a big accounting firm, that and, and many of those old ones are still LLPs, then you'll make partner. And that's where that phrase comes from. Like, you know, John is working really hard. He's hoping to make partner someday. It's because he's at one of these big accounting or law firms that is an LLP. Um, and, and some law firms are now organized as corporations uh, and, and LLCs. So if it's a corporation, you say, someday I hope to make shareholder. That's the equivalent of partner at an LLP, you'd say shareholder if it's a if it's a corporation, and then if it's an LLC, we call them members. All right, so but that just doesn't sound like someday I hope to be a member of an LLC. That just does, it's not as catchy as partner. So you'll hear people even if the law firm is an LLC or a corporation, they'll still say like, "Hey, I made partner," and you congratulate them even though they're not speaking English correctly. All right, now. In Idaho, uh, th there's a, a lot of research into this, and, and Idaho has come up with some kind of interesting LLC laws. Members of an LLC owe fiduciary duties to the LLC and the other members. Now, this is, this is different. Like, normally, um, you would expect that you would owe fiduciary duties to the company itself. But Idaho added this interesting language into the, into the LLC Act, of, of Idaho that says that you owe these fiduciary duties to other members of the other owners of the LLC. Um, anyway, just kind of something to think about, but it is, that's, that's very different. So this is a case that, that you'll read this week. It's California versus Pacific Landmark. Now in this case, uh, I think what's most interesting about it is that you've got an owner of an LLC who is running, basically kind of think of him as the landlord, the owner of a strip mall, right? And, and, and he, as the, as the owner of this LLC, 
uh, rents out the different spaces in the strip mall. Now, one of them is a massage parlor that ends up being just something not as classy as a massage. Massage parlors aren't classy, but uh, it ends up being like a, a bad place, right? And um, and he knew about it. That that's that's what I need you to remember about this case is that he knew about. It. He knew that this massage parlor was just a front for like a prostitution ring, and um, and still allowed them to operate in the business. So when the when the feds came in and shut down the business, he got sued as well. And his defense, and, and when he lost, he said, well, my defense is I'm a member of an LLC, so I'm not personally liable for the crimes that were going on here. And uh, this case was in California, which is, I think, important. Uh, and, and the court said, no, because you knew about it and because a clause in your lease agreement that said that you would check up on what they're doing, that, that they're doing lawful business in the building that you own, uh, because of all of that, um, you're personally liable as well. And so it, it serves as a warning that just because you have an LLC or any other type of business entity, that doesn't mean that you are, um, that you're free of personal liability. If you commit wrongful acts, well, then you could be personally liable for that, even with an LLC corporation or partnership that may afford you some limited liability protection. It's not absolute is kind of the, the warning of this case. All right, uh, so now we get into the advantages of the LLC. Um, now, the first main one is all the members, all the owners of the LLC get personal liability protection. And I want you to think of it, I'm actually gonna do something kind of fun here. Let me. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a whiteboard and this will allow me to kind of draw some things for you. So here I've got the LLC and I want you to think of LLC and other liability protection vehicles like corporations, um, S corps, uh, LLPs is basically providing a wall of protection. So over here, you've got somebody that you injured, your business injured or whatever, they're mad at you and they want, oh, this is actually better than the drawings I did in class. Um, and, and here's you over here. You're a little bit concerned, right? You're, you're, that's a concerned face, I think. Um, Don't mind me, I'm just drawing here. All right. But over here, you've got your boat. Yeah, it looks more like an arc. I don't care. Uh, you've got a vacation property, or maybe your house, your personal residence, and your car. Yeah, it looks like a Cybertruck. <laughs> That's a funny joke if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and here, the person that you injured, yeah, do they always have access to the LLC and the assets of the LLC? You bet, that's, you don't, you don't get to, like, it's not like because you have an LLC, nobody can ever collect damages against you. That's silly. So they can always get the assets up here of the LLC, but over here, your house, uh, this, this is your bank account, that's your house, that's your car, that's your boat. All of this is protected by this wall of liability protection. Okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me come back here. So now, now you see like that's, that's what limited liability protection is. It's protecting your personal assets from the claims of creditors. And and uh, people that you've injured, et cetera. That's, that's, that's the idea of, of all of this. So, um, and all the members get that. It's kind of like the LLP. Remember, for it, the KPMG uses, uh, just because your partner screwed up doesn't mean your personal assets are at risk. Well, yeah, that's great. But remember, LLPs are limited in who they, like who can form an LLP. 
Whereas uh, you and I operating our hot dog stand just simply can't be an LLP, but we can be an LLC and get the same liability protection as the LLP. Um, and there are some additional benefits of an LLC, which we'll get to. So, so that's the first one. All members of an LLC have that limited liability protection. All right, the second one is tax. So again, this is coming from what I said earlier in this lecture, you get the benefits of the, like the best of both worlds. So you get partnership tax, meaning that pass-through taxation, the partnership, or sorry, the LLC does not pay taxes. Uh, the LLC is a pass-through entity, just like a partnership. If you and I are 50-50 partners, we have our hot dog business, the LLC does not pay any tax. If we make 100 grand, you get $50,000, I get $50,000, voila. That's tax taken care of right there. All right, um, so that was the second bullet point here. Um, all right, the third one is foreign investors are permitted. Now, this is important because uh, some corporations, well, really it's the S corporation, uh, every owner of an S corporation has to have, has to be a US citizen, All right? And, and that can be problematic in a global economy where one of your partners is in Hong Kong or London or wherever, uh, they, they, they can't be an owner of an S corp. LLC doesn't have that rule, meaning every single member, every single owner of the LLC can be all around the world. Like they don't have, there's no US residency requirements or uh, citizenship requirements, nothing like that. So, so that's, those are the three main advantages of the LLC. Okay, now this is where uh, I always like to explain at this point in my class, this is where everything really comes together and it's killing me that we can't do these face to face because I really save the best for the end of the semester and here we are doing it like this. But, but I want you to know, uh, I get people all the time that graduated from BYU um, in business management or marketing or whatever and business law is not required for their degree and so they didn't take it and, and they kind of wasted their extra credits on like, music or something just kidding music's okay but um but they should have taken my class because they get out they want to start a business and they have no idea how to start a business i liken this to my own experience at university of san diego i took this big class it was wills and trusts right, so anyway it was, it was all about kind of estate planning and getting wills together well at the end of that class at the end of the semester I got this letter saying, congratulations, Michael, you got the highest grade out of the 150 students in your class or whatever. And I was like, oh, cool, that's, that's impressive. And, uh, and so I showed it to my dad. My, my parents wanted to see it, so I showed it to them. And, and they're like, oh, that's great. You can write our will. And I looked at them and I was like, holy crap. I don't know how to write a will. Like my wills and trusts class taught me all the rules about wills and trusts, but I had no idea how to write a will. And, and that's why I, I think part of this class is, I want you to know how to write a will. Or, well, right now I want you to learn how to start an LLC. Okay, so um, let, let, let me do this. Let, let, let's kind of run through this process of creating your LLC right now. So one, you have to decide whether or not an LLC is correct for you. Um, most of the time it is. I think something like 70% of all to 80% of all businesses in the US now that are started are LLCs. Uh, it's very common, and you'll see why. So usually that's going to be correct. Now you have to choose a name. When you choose a name, you've got to remember everything that we talked about last week in trademarks. You have to make sure it's not taken. You're going to, uh, yeah, make sure that it's not infringing on anybody else's business name. Um, and, and go through the distinctiveness process. You know, make sure it's it's not generic. It's It's... Anyway, and, and all the way to arbitrary and kind of find out where you are and if it's even, if you can even trademark it. Um, then you check for the availability of the name, the domain, and the logo. So um, let, let me jump down and then I'm going to show you how to do all of these. Um, and then you fill out the appropriate state filing. So let's do that right now. All right, let's go to a new one. So I'm going to type in, as you might guess, sos.idaho.gov. And that brings up, assuming it works, 
here we go. So I'm gonna go to business services. I'm gonna click on business filings. And here I'm gonna go for search a business. I'm gonna see if there's, if, if this business name is taken by anybody else in the state. So, um, and, and to do this, let, let me just show you my own company name. So my law firm's name is Targi Law. So let's say I just moved here and I wanted to start a law firm called Targi Law. And I enter it in, hit search, and I think, shoot, somebody's already taken it, right? Like, uh, and, and of course this is me, so that's okay. Uh, but if I click on it, then I'll be able to see that um, it's been existing since 2017. Um, I'm going to have to renew it here up in a month, it looks like, and it's got my name and all of that. It's just available for the public, and there it is. So if I was starting a new firm and I couldn't call it Targi Law, I'd, I'd think, okay, let me name it something else. So I'm going to come up with just a, let's just do like an arbitrary name. Um, Methusamana, Methusamana Law. That's going to be the name of my law firm. I'm hoping nobody else has that. And look, nobody else does. So now just because nobody has it in the state of Idaho doesn't mean anybody doesn't, nobody has it anywhere. So I'm just going to do a Google search for this real quick. Methusamana Law. Again, zero search in Google means this is great. I'm going to get it. Well, one more thing we have to do. I have to make sure nobody else has this domain. Because, yeah, if nobody's using that name, great. But if you can't buy the web address for the company that you're looking for, well, it's all a waste. So I'm going to go to this website called who.is. And here I'm going to put in, let's say I want my domain name to be methusalmanalaw.com. So I'm going to make sure nobody's purchased this domain. So I click that, and it looks like nobody has. So this is the perfect set of events here. I, I, I get this. I can start it. So let's go back and kind of start um, with the Secretary of State. So I'm going to go back to the Secretary of State's website, because I'm going to register this first, and I'm going to get the website and all of that. But now I go into business search, and instead of doing a business Sorry, I'm going into business services. And instead of doing a business search, I've already done that. So I'm going to go to business filings. So here, there's this little, let me make this a little bigger here. All right, so here's this button called start a business. All right, I click on that. And here is where I get to choose what type of business I want to form in Idaho. So I've got the option of a corporation, a limited liability company, or a domestic partnership. Um, so I'm just going to come over here. I'm going to do the LLC. It's a hundred dollars. I'm going to hit okay. I'm going to file this online. Now I've got my own login, but you'd have to create an account. Now it takes two seconds. So I come in here. I'm going to do a standard filing fee. I'm going to create a limited liability company. Now, actually, I'm going to have to click on this one, a professional limited liability company, because if you are a, an accounting firm, a law firm, an architecture firm, or a medical office, uh, you, you just have to click. It doesn't make any difference at all, but you're, you're going to be a professional limited liability company. All right, I previously filed reserve name. Nope, I don't have that. So here I put in the Fusulmana Law PLLC, and then I'm uh, and then I'm going to have to do it again. Uh, PLLC. Where did that come? Oh, good gracious. There we go. All right. Now, if I was doing this correctly, I'd capitalize and PLLC should all be capitalized, but whatever. Um, all right. And because I put that I'm a professional one, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to pick that I'm a law firm. Uh, and here are those other professional things that you can choose from. All right, go to the next step. This is where I'm just going to put in my address. So you're going to go through, put in the address of the principal office of the building. Now, if it's a remote virtual office, you just put your home address as well as the mailing address. Just put your home address. That's what I've done with my law firm. And then you can go to the next. Um, now, this is where you get to the registered agent. This is so important. Everybody thinks like, oh, registered agent. And they go back and they think like, this must be the agent of the company. Like, 
like somebody that has the authority to transact for the business. Throw that out for now. That's what an agent is. A registered agent is something totally different. And a registered agent is just the person or business that is going to, um, if you get sued, so if my Methuselmana law firm ever gets sued, then the service of process, the, the, the person that brings that, the, the summons and the complaint, to get it to me, they bring it to the registered agent. So that's what this is. So um, I would just put, it, now you can have a commercial agent, meaning these are companies that exist only to be your registered agent. They have offices in Boise, and you can search for them and just put in, what's, what's like a big one, P, PC, PT Corporation, something like that. And that's all that they do is you pay them 100 bucks a year, and if you ever get sued, then they get that, that they will take that lawsuit for you, send you a quick email saying, hey, you just got sued. We're FedExing the complaint, the summons and the complaint to you right now. And then they'll put that in a FedEx and mail it off to you. That's, that's all that they do. They don't have authority to transact business for you. A registered agent is just really there to collect the summons and complaint when you get sued. So you can have a corporation do it, or it could just be yourself. So, so, so with me, I just did, uh, I should be in their system because I'm the registered agent for my own law firm. So if I put in Michael Hales and do a search, there I am. So I just click that and I'm done. I can move on to the next one. All right, next we get to governors. This is a stupid new thing. I don't know why they changed it to governors. It used to be members or managers. This just means like, as it says up here, enter the name and address of at least one governor, meaning like one owner, one agent of the limited liability company. Um, and so, yeah, you just click add, put your own name in 99% of the time, and then you put add and you're good. You confirm everything, kind of go through it. Uh, you declare and you sign it, you click all of these boxes saying you know what you're doing, and then you file it and you pay your $100 online just with a credit card. After you do that, it takes about a week. And then when you come back here to do a search, I'm just gonna cancel all of this out. When you come back here and do a search for your company and put this in, it will, instead of saying nothing is there, it'll say your business is now registered with the state and you're done. Like you've created a business uh, with the Secretary of State in the state of Idaho. So first big thing done. Now after that, yeah, you'll go, get that domain and you can do that. Uh, so I do a lot of that through uh, Google domains, but you can do it through like GoDaddy and Bluehost. There's, there's all of Squarespace, like, like there's lots of ways that you can get and purchase the, the URL, the, the internet domain for the name of your company. Uh, so yeah, you'll do that. And then let's just, let's head on back here. So um, at that point, you, we've done three and four, so we've, we've got the domain, the logo, uh, and then we've filled out the appropriate state filing. At this point, we move on to number five, writing your operating agreement. And this, you kind of know what this is already because we talked about it in the last lecture. It's If you have a partnership, then you create a partnership agreement. If you create an LLC, then you create an operating agreement. And if you start a corporation, then you have bylaws. These are all the same thing. This is just the governing document that shows how your business is going to be run. That's, that's really it. So, um, and, and, I'm, and I give you in this week's iLearn module kind of a couple of different operating agreements that you are welcome to take and adapt and adopt to your own businesses. Um, these are things that a lot of law firms will charge you like two to six grand to write for you. I'm just giving it to you. So take these, some are like simple single member LLC operating agreements. Others are multi-member LLC operating agreements. I've spent a whole lot of time writing these. Um, I think that they are valuable and important and that's why I'm giving them to you for free. Um, it's your bonus for taking my class. This is another reason I think taking my class is worth the cost of tuition. Uh, I have another surprise for you in week 13. But for now, I'm giving you free operating agreements. And you kind of look, and, and an operating agreement 
or a partnership agreement or bylaws. This just says how the business is gonna be run. Like if you're gonna sell the business, what percentage of the owners or the ownership voting units have to authorize the sale of the business? Um, how are you going to be taxed? How, like, like all of this is decided in the operating agreement. And you'll see in my forms that I've got there, like I just kind of lay it out, and uh, make it relatively simple for you. Okay, once you've done that, then, or even before that, you're gonna get your EIN. This is your employer identification number. Okay, so let me show again. In the Google bar, you're gonna just put get EIN, hit enter, and then you're gonna scroll down all of these ads. Do not fall for it. These are all ads and they're gonna make you pay money. And you don't have to do that. Go all the way down to the first one, which is irs.gov. So you can trust this one and apply for your employer identification number. Um, what you'll do is you'll just hit this blue apply online now button. And um, this, you begin the application. You say, I'm a limited liability company. Um, let's see, I keep moving. All right, how many members are in the LLC? If it's just one, you put one. If there's two, you put two. Why am I even telling you? You know how to do this. Uh, and then you're gonna state where the, the state that you're filing. So I would put Idaho, let's just say one here. Because there's only a one member, you're considered a single member LLC, um, which means you're, it's a pass-through taxation directly to you, and you don't have to worry about some of the partnership stuff that you would if you have multiple partners. So again, um, I'm a single member LLC, so I'm just gonna hit continue. Um, I'm doing this because I started a new business. And here I start putting in my information. I hit continue, I put in my address. I put in more information about what type of business I am here in the details section. And when I'm done with that, it just spits out a number. It's basically the social security number for a business. Um, and I've got my own EIN number for my law firm. And when I file taxes, I use that to identify my law firm. And, uh, and you have to do that. And so just do it as soon as you've um, registered your business, you can do it right away. All right, back to what we've got. So now we've, and, and by the way, it just spits it, it's free, and it'll give it to you in about five minutes after you start the application. It takes no time. Just print off that form, keep it with your important business files. Uh, so you don't lose it. Okay, at that point, once you have the EIN and your company is registered with the state and showing up, like, like once you register with the state, like I said, it normally takes about seven days for it to show up and get processed through the Idaho Secretary of State's website. But once it is processed and it's showing, like you search for the name of your company and it's showing up and you have the EIN, then you take, that. then at that point you go and open a bank account, a small business or a business bank account, checking account typically. All right, I do this in Mountain America, but Zion, uh, um, Zion's bank does it, every bank does it, like, like literally, dang it, turn my light on again. Um, every, every bank does, has small business, and usually these are free checking accounts for small businesses, so um, that's what you do. Now, that's gonna be important because we're gonna go back to that wall of limited liability protection in a minute, and it's gonna be important that you have a checking account for the business so that you're not commingling your money, but we'll get to that in a second. All right, you can also get a loan. Uh, you can also get a loan at that point, uh, get some business insurance. It's usually relatively cheap and worth the peace of mind. Um, and then you start working. And, and as you are working, as you are operating your business, you remember every other dang thing that I taught you this semester. So you don't breach your contracts. You don't harass employees, you don't discriminate, you don't commit crimes or torts, you, you know what intellectual property laws are now. These are all the things that you do now that you have started a business and you can operate your LLC, okay? And then of course, remember tax laws, which kind of hint on, we talk about during this unit, but really it's week 13's classes that I'll hit that a little bit harder. All right, um, once you've done that, like, like I said, this is the limited liability Certificate of Organization. Uh, this is what you get. This is what you have, were filling out online when I showed you how to do that at the Secretary of State's website. This is where all that information goes. 
Um, most states call these the Articles of Organization. In Idaho, we call them the Certificate of Organization. It's the same thing. I don't know why Idaho had to be different. Drives me nuts. Um, and here's just kind of one of those sample operating agreements that I've put for you in iLearn. So uh, you know what that is now. Uh, these are common things that you'll see in operating agreements, um, how the company will be managed, um, how you, again, just read through this slide uh, that you already have in iLearn anyway. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the main things that we talk about with an LLC. Now, with getting out of an LLC, um, it's, it can be a little bit complicated. Um, let me say this. If there's no operating agreement, no document governing how to get out of, a, how to, out of an operating agreement, then um, this slide applies. So, okay. So what that means is you can say, I'm done, I'm out, I quit. All right. If you do that, um, well, yeah, you can typically still have a profit interest. It just means that you've, you, you can't manage the company anymore, but you're still a member entitled to, a, to the profits coming out of the company. And you can see why you would hate this. If you had an LLC operating it with your best friend and then your best friend just stops working, but still gets all like 50% of the profits from all of your work, you can imagine why you would hate that. So in most operating agreements that I write, I say you don't have the authority to just withdraw. And if, and if you do, then there's going to be penalties for that. Um, okay. And now, if your friend does that, you may just elect to buy your friend out. And, or it doesn't even have to be a friend, just the, the person that you're doing business with, you may buy them out and, and you can set out in the operating agreement how you're going to come up with the buyout price. It doesn't always just have to be some set like fair market value thing. It, it, you can talk about how you're going to buy them out. Um, anyway, um, but if one person, like if it's in the operating agreement that you can't dissociate, you can't just leave, well, then you may be liable for damages under the terms of that agreement. And I think that's a smart thing to do to make sure that other people aren't leaving. And if they do leave, that it's a mutual thing and, and the buyout price is fair. Um, yeah. So anyway, and, and this first bullet point on the slide is important. Uh, if you die, guess what? Like, we're going to let you out of, of your LLC ownership interest. Like, yeah. Um, and, and bankruptcy and confidence expulsion. That's just like everybody else voted you out. Sorry, you're gone. But again, this, this can get sticky and this can get ugly. So having an operating agreement that reviews how to do this, I think is vital and key. Okay, so, so with that, I think we've covered the basics of LLCs, uh, their management, uh, limited liability protections. Um, now what we're gonna do is next week, if I go back to my whiteboard here, uh, next week, what we're going to do is when we get into corporations, that's when we get into some interesting things. And uh, like I said, with corporations, LLCs have the same basic liability protections that corporations do. So um, what that means is we'll get into more detail about how clients may break through this wall of liability protection and get access to these personal assets. And, it's, and it applies to corporations as well as to LLCs and partnership. That liability protection wall, it's not absolute. There are things that you, this scared person right here, can do basically to take chunks out of your wall here. And, oh, I do have an eraser. Um, oops, I deleted the whole thing. To, basically eliminate your liability protection. And so we're gonna talk about that when we get into corporations. And so that, that's, a, that's a fun class. And then of course, we'll talk about corporate taxation as well 
uh, since really w when we're talking about corporations, really, I, I, I like to keep things relatively simple. You've got two considerations, really, when deciding what type of business to start. Um, it's liability and it's tax. And those are different with partnerships, LLCs, and corporations. So um, that's, that's what we'll be getting into. And you'll kind of see the big picture once we get through corporations. So, all right. Um, hope you enjoyed this lecture and I'll see you soon.